seated. Well, today we're going to fly through Genesis 9 through 11, and we just do the best we can to pull out some application as we go through. So we've seen so far in our study the major events in Genesis. First of all, the creation. Then we saw the fall of man due to sin. And then we saw the flood where God judged sin. And today we're going to conclude this third um, event as well as go into the fourth event. But we look at God's deliverance by and his covenant or his promises. So in Genesis 9, first we see God's blessing in verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is repeating the command that God gave to Adam and Eve back in Genesis 1.28. And that's exactly what they do. Look down at verse 18 where it says the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 19, these three were the sons of Noah, and from these three, the whole earth was populated. So from these three sons of Noah came the nations, meaning that every single one of us are descendants from one father. We all came from Noah, one way or another. And so Since God blessed Noah and told him to be fruitful, we too can claim that promise. We too can be fruitful when we obey his command, not just in the physical realm, but also, and I think more importantly, in the spiritual realm. It's just as Paul prayed in Colossians 1.10. He prayed for the people. He said that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. As we seek the Lord, as we increase in our knowledge of him, not our head knowledge, but in our experiential knowledge of the Lord, we will be pleasing to him. Well, in verse 2, God's blessing continues, and it's seen in the power and authority that he's given man over every creature. God says in verse 2, the fear And the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air and all that move on the earth and that all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So we see, number one, that the animals after the flood will now fear man or the the relationship between man and animals has completely changed you see before the flood before the judgment of sin man and animal had a peaceful relationship and the key is that there was no fear between the two which was god's original design but sin came in and messed that relationship up and now not only do animals fear man I don't know about you, I just saw a cougar chasing a guy through a wooded area. Man fears animals as well, unless we have a gun or a bow and arrow, I guess. But we know that God's desire from the beginning was for our relationship with not only the animals in his creation, but with God and with one another was to flow from love. Fear ruins everything. But And because sin separates relationships, and that's what creates fear. That's why 1 John 4.18 tells us that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. He who fears has not been made perfect in love, but we love him because he first loved us. So we see that we can't have a relationship if we fear one another. But the good news is one day, In the millennial kingdom, God is going to restore things back to the way it was in the garden, where the lion will lay with the lamb and the child will put its hand in the the vapor's nest and not get bitten. I just had another rattlesnake yesterday. Oh, what, what a glorious time it will be in the millennial kingdom when we don't have to worry about that stuff. Amen. Well, Presumably, this change in relationship between man and animal was due to the changes in climate because now God gives man permission to eat meat. And I say, 
Hallelujah, we don't have to be vegetarians. <laughs> Can't imagine. If you're a vegetarian, God bless you. But in verse 4, God gives restrictions for eating meat. He says that you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now, the blood idea of eating the animal with its blood was serious business. Back in Leviticus 17, we are told where God said that whoever eats any blood, I will set my face against that person. I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the souls. And down in verse 14, it says, For the blood is the life of all flesh, and its blood sustains its life, and whoever eats it shall be cut off. And so not only in Leviticus 17, but other areas in the Old Testament, we see that the children of Israel, they were forbidden to eat anything with the blood or to eat blood. But it's not just an Old Testament principle. You see, at the Council of Jerusalem, when, when the Gentiles were, were getting saved and they were coming to faith in, in, the, in, in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ, when addressing the first century church, the religious leaders were telling these Gentiles that they had to be circumcised, they had to uphold the law, they were putting all kinds of rules on the Gentiles that weren't really applicable for them. And they told them that if they wanted to be saved, they had to do these things. So in Acts 15, 22, to settle the dispute, they decided to send chosen men to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas to deliver a letter. And in Acts 15, 23, the letter was written by the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, saying, we gave no such commandment about being circumcised or keeping the law. So as they were assembled with one accord, they said in verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And then they explain in verse 29, these necessary things were that as the Gentiles were being saved, that they would abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from the things strangled, which meant that they had their blood in them, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Simple. So they reduced it down, but also the fact that not partaking in the blood was included in that. And it's important because you see the blood represents life, as we just saw in Leviticus 17. And the life represents the blood, which represents Jesus Christ. In 1 John 1, 7, it tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In Hebrews 9, uh, 10, 19, it tells us that we have been given boldness to enter in to the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. In Hebrews 3, 12, we're told that we are sanctified by his blood. And in Revelation 12, 1, it tells us that the saints will overcome the enemy, we will overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So the issue of blood is very, it's extremely important even for us today as believers as it points to our eternal life through Jesus Christ. Well, back in Genesis 9-5, not only are we not to partake of the blood of animals, but our blood, our life, human life, is counted precious before God. You see, God is pro-life. He is pro-temporal life as well as eternal life. And he continues in verse 5. He says, Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning, even from the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man." In verse 6, whoever sheds a man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So again, we see that God is very pro-life. And it's because man is made in the image of God and life 
is precious. It cannot be taken without giving an account to God. That's what the Bible says. It clearly points back to what we know as the death penalty today. In Exodus 21, 14, it says, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And he who strikes or even curses his father or his mother shall surely put, be put to death. We all need to teach our kids that, right? But verse 16 says, he who kidnaps, here we see the sex trafficking thing that is so prevalent today and the kidnapping that is going on like crazy today. He, God has something to say about that. He says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And this is also this concept seen in Romans 13. But the Bible makes a distinction that not all killing is murder. You see, killings can be self-defense, a result of war, or a result of an accident. That God does not demand your life be taken for. But as we just saw, when someone commits a murder, taking another person's life purposefully and unjustified, God takes that seriously, and he says that his life should be taken. Well, then in verse 8, we see the actual covenant with Noah, which is the first of five covenants between God and his people. Verse 8, then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, as, as, and as far as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you. Of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Verse 11, thus I establish my covenant with you. Here it is. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, it's not that God made a mistake in sending the flood and destroying everything by the flood. But instead, he makes the promise or the covenant with Noah and his descendants that he would never destroy the earth again by a flood. And that is key. Back to Genesis 9, 12. So the sign of the covenant, God said, this is the sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud that it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And then verse 15, the covenant itself. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. So here, we need to not confuse the covenant um, being that God said he would not flood the earth again when he judges, because he will judge the earth. He used the rainbow as the sign that he would be faithful to his covenant. So when we see the rainbow, we know that God is faithful to his promise. Now remember, we've seen the same things that were happening in the, same, in the days of Noah. We've seen in Matthew 24, 37, that it will happen again, as in the days of Noah, speaking of the sin that was going on. It's meaning that God will destroy the earth again. But the next time we've seen in 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7, it will be not by a flood, but through fire. And remember, we're not going to be here because we're going to be in heaven with Jesus during that time. Amen, right? Because it will happen. Now, as that is all established, my big wow moment this week was that I found it really interesting as a certain group would use the rainbow as their banner. And, and I thought of that because, listen, the promise 
is not that he will not judge sin again, especially the sin that was going on in the days of Noah. Sin contradicted God's created purpose for his creation. We have to remember and not lose sight of the fact that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he judged the sin back then, he will judge the sin today and in the future. And so his definition of sin does not change, regardless of what is accepted in society around us. So the promise, again, is that he will not use a flood to destroy the earth again in his judgment. In other words, and this is what really got me, the rainbow in reality is God's reminder that he will judge the earth again. In other words, waving that rainbow flag over our head while living in a lifestyle that is contradictory to what God says is okay, as in the days of Noah, is in fact calling judgment down upon yourself. And that just really broke my heart. It should grieve our hearts. You see, I used to be irritated at the fact that they would hijack our symbol. But as I looked at this this week, I realized how grievous it truly is. It doesn't irritate me, it grieves me. Because they're deceived and they don't know. But isn't that just like Satan? They come in and deceive Surely you will not die if you partake of what God forbids. And that's exactly what he's doing again in a different way. So every time we see the rainbow, we can remember the faithfulness of God to his promises. Some are popular and some are unpopular. But nevertheless, God will be faithful to his promise. Now we've already looked at verses 18 and 19. And then in verse 20, we see Noah's problem. It says that Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered. Now, this word uncovered kind of carries the idea of undressed or naked, having a sexual connotation to it. And he became uncovered in his tent. Now, this, again, we've seen a lot of firsts. This is the first time we see being drunk mentioned in the Bible. And as I thought about that, I thought about how Noah had been delivered, and all that Noah had been through, I mean, think about it, 120 years ridiculed for taking that step of faith and obedience to God to build an ark when he didn't even know what it was for the rain that he didn't even know what was coming, and and he was so faithful, he had just been delivered. And Noah's first act, remember, after he was saved, when he came off the ark, was to sacrifice and worship to God. He was so thankful and so mindful of God's presence and all that God had done. It was all good as his focus was on God. But here, it would seem that Noah let his guard down. And he ended up partaking in something that he should not have. And the result was that Noah became drunk with wine. Now, there's speculation that the fermentation wasn't there before the flood, that it was after the flood, and he didn't know. Um, It's speculated that his son gave it to him and did it on purpose. We don't really know because we weren't there, but we do know that he became drunk. Jesus told the disciples in Mark 14, 37, to watch and to pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is truly willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we see that, yes, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was a righteous man, and he did the things that were right. He obeyed God, but it would seem as though more than anything that he let his guard down. You know, that's why we are told over and over to be alert, to wake up, to watch, and to be ready, because the devil is roaring around like a lion seeking whom he may devour, and he wants to devour us so that he can devour our children and our grandchildren. He just wants to say, surely you will not die, partake. And so we're told to come out from among them and be separate so that we can be that vessel of honor for the master's use. You see, anytime we let our guard down, we grow complacent, don't we? Our focus starts shifting from God and spiritual things to the things of the world. And before we know it, We wake up and think, how did I get here? Because it's just a slow digression. Proverbs 21, 
warns us that wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. In Ephesians 5, 17 through 19, Paul says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but rather instead, strong car- contrast, we are to be filled with the Spirit. And so I think it's pretty fair to say through Scripture that, that the Holy Spirit and alcohol do not mix. They are contrary to one another. Because while the Holy Spirit represents wisdom from above, being alert and having a clear mind, the alcohol represents dullness and foolish foolishness as it dulls our senses. And we all have a choice of what to be under the influence of. We can be under the influence of the things of this world, or we can be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but there is no high, there is no peace, no comfort, nothing compared to being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And if you have not experienced that, come see me afterwards. Let's pray for a fresh filling or a baptism with the Holy Spirit, because there truly is nothing in this world that can match that. Well, it's not surprising that Noah getting drunk caused problems, because I know, I don't know about you, I've never heard of any good that comes from it. Clark always says, we've never once had anybody in the office come in and say, I'm so glad that I'm an alcoholic and that I get drunk every night. My job is so much better. My family's so much better. My kids are doing better. We never hear that. But we have heard people come in that have lost everything. They've lost their families. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their savings. They've lost their homes. And it's just tragic. It's so sad. I was reading some statistics, and it says that the FBI says that 50% of all rapes involve alcohol. And that's not even to mention the, the, the deaths that come from drunk driving and things like that. So what good comes of it? I personally believe it's just best to stay clear of it, but it's something that as the Lord needs to lead you individually. Well, back to verse 22, we see that presumably one of his sons, namely Ham, is the one that got him drunk. And because the phrase nakedness or uncovered carries that sexual relations idea, it's likely speaking of a sexual assault or some sort of sexual immorality involving Noah while he was under the influence or when he was drunk. And then in verse 22, it says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, which is Noah's grandson, Ham saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, what we see is this idea that he went and told his brothers carries the idea that he went and told them with delight of what he saw in his father's tent. Some say that Ham molested his father and then mocked him to undermine his reputation or authority as a man of God, as a preacher of righteousness. And if that is the case, we know exactly who is behind that. It's exactly what Satan tries to do to each and every believer. As we know that Revelation 12.10 tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. In whatever case that it may be, it seemed to please Ham to see his father overcome in sin. And as I thought about that, I thought how sick and twisted that would be. Yet, we know that it's common today, don't we? It's common for those who are in sin themselves to rejoice at the sin of others when they fall. And it's the opposite of what God calls us to do. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And how revealing this is. Because if we are truly walking with God and we're sorry for our own sins, we will never rejoice at someone else living in sin. We would rather grieve for them. As the Spirit of God is in us, as the Spirit of God is grieved, we too will grieve. Well, back to Genesis verse 23, it says, but Shem and Japheth 
the good sons, took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward, went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, a picture of 1 Peter 4, 8, covering a multitude of sin. And their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, speaking of the Canaanites, the descendants of Ham, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan, or Ham's descendants, be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So what we see with this is that Noah started out well, didn't he? He started out strong. He served God in his own generation, preacher of righteousness. He was a righteous man whose faith spared the entire family by obeying God's voice. Yet, it didn't take long for him to mar his reputation as he let his guard down, he got drunk, and it left him open to the enemy. And as we look at that, we have to take heed. What a lesson for us. Because while it's good to start out well, I think we can all say we started out well when we got saved. We understood we were nothing but dirty, rotten sinners, and we needed Jesus to save us. But we must continue to abide in his grace. We must continue our walk with him to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, it is so easy to ruin our reputation with peers. As the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And the enemy always has those people that will rejoice in your downfall, and they will definitely let everyone know around you. And we can be sure that the enemy the moment we slip up, the enemy is right there to broadcast it. But the good news is that God's mercies are new every morning. Isn't that awesome? I'm so thankful that our God is a merciful God. There's nowhere that we can go that God, his grace, can't find us if we want it. And as we come to him, he will, behold, make all things new. Wipe our slate clean. Well, that brings us to Genesis 10, where we see the table of nations. This is dealing with the fourth event in Genesis, which is the dispersion of the population after the flood in chapter 10. And down all the way in chapter 10, verse 29, after going through all the names, which we looked at in our homework, and I'll spare you of that. These were the families of the sons of Noah, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So it's really a good genealogy because it's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So I'm glad that we were able to spend some time with that in our homework. But that brings us to Genesis chapter 11, where the fourth event continues, um, population after the flood. Number one, that we see a problem of pride in verses one through nine. Verse, uh, yes, verse, verse one. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech or one dialect, which makes sense because God created us all with the ability to communicate through language. And we're all from the same family, so everybody spoke the same dialect, the same language. And then it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar um, in ancient Babylon or modern day Tur uh, Iraq. And they dwelt there. Now this is where Nimrod settled. His name means rebellion. But settling was a sign of rebellion because God told them to disperse. So rather than obey God in their pride, they decided to reason among themselves to do what they thought was the right thing. Now, while there's wisdom and a multitude of counsel, when God speaks, there's no reason to get the opinions of other people. We just need to do it. Amen? God tells us to do something, we do it. It doesn't matter what people say or what people think. 1 Samuel 15, tells us that to be, obey is better than sacrifice. In Proverbs 16, 25, it says, there is a way that seems right to a man but in its end, 
the way, it's the way of death. We have to remember what God said in Isaiah 59, or 55, 8 and 9, where he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. Whereas the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In fact, oftentimes when God tells us to do something and it doesn't make sense, that's when we know it's of the Lord because he works against all common sense usually. But they did what they thought was best, what seemed right to them, which was a mistake in verse 3. It said, then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar, which were the same um, materials used on the ark with Noah. So they looked to the past at what Noah had done. And we're told in Isaiah 43, 18, that's never a good idea. God tells us, as he was even speaking of the parting of the Red Sea, he says, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Don't look backwards at the way God worked in the past. Because in verse 19, he says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? In other words, are you so looking backwards at how God worked in the past? that you can't see what's in front of you when God's springing up a new work right in front of you. So the only thing that should have been copied is the fact that Noah obeyed God by faith. Back to verse 4 where they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, which re represents them reaching up to God, which represents religion. That's always what religion does, is try to work our way to God and in favor of God. And he says, let us make a name for ourselves. Notice the emphasis was on self, just like Satan. In Isaiah uh, 14, last night, Pastor Clark looked through that, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, the I wills of Satan. He thought he was something else, and he was, let me tell you, when he fell to the earth. But this is what they're, they're emulating. It says, lest we be scattered abroad above the face of the whole earth, which was ultimately God's plan. You see, they wanted to stay in a holy huddle. They had the comfort of each other. They wanted to stay together. And God says, no, you need to disperse because how can people know about the coming Messiah if you don't go out and tell them? And I think, wow, how quickly we see that pride took over as they had become self-sufficient and self-centered. Ultimately, like I said, Isaiah 14, they wanted to be like God, to build their own kingdom, but their kingdom would be built in the flesh. <clears throat> and it shows any time that when we're in the midst of the storm and realize we have no power to save ourselves or no power to change our situation, that's when we cling to God. We fully rely upon him in those moments, but the moment things go smooth, and we have all the materials in the flesh and all the ability to be able to do it on our own, we fall right back quickly to self-reliance. And that is precisely why trials are so good, because they keep us on our knees. I had a lady come up and pray with me last night, and um, <clears throat> it was amazing, because as thinking about this whole concept, the things that she was sharing with me, all that was coming out of her mouth is God is so merciful, he's so wonderful. And her countenance was truly, sincerely praising God. And I'm telling you, her husband's been on a feeding tube at a nursing home for over a year. Her parents are suffering with dementia. She has so much on her plate that I just began to feel her pain and just started weeping. And then I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's wrong. Tears were just flowing because I felt her pain. But she was reliant upon God and worshiping him because of these situations. And that's what the trials do. They keep us close to God and they're good. If he tells us to disperse and we don't like it, we need to disperse because it's going to keep us reliant upon him. If he tells us to stay together, then we stay together. But we do whatever he tells us to do because that is when he will get the victory. And we can worship him the entire time. Well, as I thought about the materials that were used, I thought they were uh, telling because they represent not only 
disobedience to God's command to fill the earth, but also their unbelief. Did you notice that? That they obviously didn't believe that God's promise was never to flood the earth again. They already got it confused that early on because it's seen in the waterproofing and the height of the tower that they were building, obviously to keep it from being flooded. Well, in verse 5, but the Lord Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. You see, man was trying to reach up, but God supernaturally came down. And I loved that because God ultimately has come down in the form of his spirit to dwell among us today. He is with us. He sees us and he sees everything that's going on. And I am so thankful for that. And the Lord said, indeed, the people, verse 6, are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. In their pride and rebellion, now they will continue, and nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Because indeed, if we operate in the flesh, we are capable of some pretty impressive things, aren't we? Well, I might not be, but you probably are. But the flesh can look so good. I forget who it was that said if you took the Holy Spirit out of the church that the the world wouldn't even be able to see the difference these days because they're going about their business. And I thought of that and I thought of how they looked great in the flesh and what they were doing. They had the, the ingenuity to build this tower, but spiritually they were falling away from God's plan. And we just looked at that in Revelation 3 at the church of Sardis, where it was the dead church, and where their works were so impressive. They had all the programs. They had a great reputation with man. But like our study today, God came down and saw their heart. It reminds me of Matthew 23 when Jesus addressed the scribes and Pharisees, calling them hypocrites. He said, you're like whitewashed tombs. Indeed, you appear beautiful outwardly but inside you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, it looked like a good idea, sounded like a good idea, but it was not God's plan. And sometimes, as is the case here, we need to see for God to save us from ourselves. So God says in verse 7, Come, let us, Elohim, speaking of the Trinity, going down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech, which is actually God's mercy to frustrate their plans. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So Babel represents self-sufficiency. It represents rebellion against God and unbelief in God's promises. And I think that this is a great lesson for us as God will have his way with or without us. He will, we can either humble ourselves or he will humble us. And we don't want him to humble us. We want to humble ourselves. It's a lot less painful that way. And and so it's always best to seek his direction. Then in verses 10 through 25, it takes us back to the genealogical records dealing with the people of Shem, from Shem to Terah, who is the father of Abraham. And so again, this is the most important genealogy as it leads to the King David, which eventually leads to Jesus Christ. So verse 10, the genealogy of Shem, only two years after the flood, down in verse um, 26, Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now, like Noah, Abram was known for great faith. We know that he was known as a friend of God in James 2.23, in 2 Chronicles 27, and in Isaiah 41.8. And while we might not be a lot of things, we might not get to see some miracles that Abraham saw. Yet as we put our faith in the same God, the God of Abraham, we too can be called friends of God. Isn't that beautiful? 
We are a friend of God. Jesus called us. You're no longer a servant, but you are my friend. And so as we put our faith in the same God, that is where we need to be. Then verses 29 and 30, we see Abram and his brother Nahor, and they took wives. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. So while Abram means father, and Sarai was unable to bear children, this sets the stage, again, this horrible trial, sets the stage for God to show his miraculous power and faithfulness as he brings the nation of Israel through this barren couple. And in verse 31, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and they went out with them from the Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So Terah died in Haran at 205 years old. What a lesson this week has been. I hope you guys were able to glean some application for your own lives through your study or from this today. But it was pretty powerful, especially for me as I I looked at that rainbow. Next week, we're going to see the call of Abram and how Abram's faith works out in a practical way through the call of the obedience to God. And so today we're reminded that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will be faithful to his promise. His word is not going to change, but it endures forever through all generations. The Lord has come down, and he sees you. He sees all. He is with us. And he desires to pour out his mercy upon you. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. God, just the little nuggets that you show us and and how you um, touch our hearts, God, to help us to own your word. So important that we continue steadfastly in prayer and in doctrine and the breaking of bread. And that is exactly what we're here to do today. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless these ladies, that they would be glad because they came. God, that you would speak to them, that you would touch them, that you would grow them, that you would bless them. God, abundantly pour out your spirit upon your people, I pray, as we are living in the last days. Help us to be alert, to watch, to wake up and look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who will be here soon and very soon. So we love you, Lord. We commit our lives to you. And we just pray that you would be glorified in our discussions today. In Jesus' name.